Welcome to the Classical Drunks, the podcast that attempts to make rationality great again. For this episode, we are very pleased to invite our good friend Ashling O'Brien, who is a fellow atheist and a vegan activist. We sat down to discuss moral questions around animal welfare and animal rights. So I'm, I'm going to read um, a little bit from the prologue from Tom Regan's Empty Cages, uh, Facing the Challenge of Animal Rights. And just to set the scene, this is a documentary that went out on American TV a few years back, a good few years back, and it describes the scene in a restaurant, a small local Chinese restaurant, strangely enough, in China. Um, so you know how in some American restaurants, patrons get to choose from among live lobsters or live fish. And now, and how, after they make their selection, the animal's, animal is killed and the chef cooks a meal of their choice. At this Chinese restaurant, things are the same, except that the menu is different. At this restaurant, patrons get to select from among live cats and dogs. The video takes its time. First, we see the hungry patrons inspect the cats and dogs, jammed cheek by jowl into wooden cages. Next, we see them talk it over. Then we see them get to make their selection. Finally, we see a man, the cook I assume, using long metal tongs, yank a fluffy white cat from her cage and hurry into the kitchen. What follows does not make for pleasant reading, so feel free to skip the next paragraph. While the cat claws and screeches, the cook hits her several times with an iron bar. Clawing and screeching, more now, she is abruptly submerged in a tub of scalding water for about 10 seconds. Once removed, and while still alive, the cook skins her from head to tail in one swift pull. He then throws the traumatised animal into a large stone vat where, as the camera zooms in, we watch her gulp slowly with increasing difficulty. Her eyes glazed until her last breath taken. She drowns. The whole episode, from, final to, to, from selection to final breath, takes several minutes. When the meal is served, the diners eat heartily, offering thanks and praise to the cook. Yeah. So this is very interesting because the first thing that prompted my mind uh, when you read that mm. is um, like if you know um, I, I like to apply the the um, the idea of the the pyramid of Maslow that mm. idea of the, there's a like a psychological development of needs that when you you know when you don't have anything your first priority is getting food water Absolutely. and then shelter and then yeah. you you increase. And I am getting the sense that uh, if you look in historical terms, if you look at the development of the last few decades, you can apply a similar reasoning to the way we treat animals. Mm -hmm. That uh, there is a um, now that we're ri rising in uh, economical terms, in cultural terms, in terms of a moral understanding, in mm -hmm. philosophical terms, that uh, um, you know, w w veganism is just kind of one narrow understanding of of what I would call a, you know, maybe a broader movement of, of um, being more caring and, and being more concerned with the, the, the treatment of animals in mm. broad terms. I, I don't know if that makes sense. Um, no, I get where you're coming from. I think what's interesting is um, I think it's a broader movement, of a, a rights-based yes. movement. So we're now uh, accepting that all humans have rights, regardless of gender, sexual orientation, yeah. colour ethnicity and now we're looking at how we can start to apply those rights to non-human animals but i think your analogy of the, using the maslow's hierarchy of needs i think we've actually taken a step back as as a species with regard to, to the treatment of animals and the respect to the rights of animals i think going back historically um, the generations before us had more respect for animals because they understood that animals had a much more important role to play in their survival. So y you treated your animals with dignity and you took better care of their welfare because they weren't as disposable as they are to us now. You know, um, farmers who keep chickens don't use antibiotics if they get sick. They just leave them because financially it's not worth their while. Where if you were a small holder farmer back in the day and those chickens were literally your lifeline, then you took really good care of them. There might not have been antibiotics, but you didn't leave them sick and suffering because they had a greater, um, uh, you know, they meant more to you and your family. You had a greater dependency on them than we do. We, we've reached a stage where animals are just nothing more than, than commodities. So, yeah, I can definitely see that. 
But I think that's because we've moved more from, um, like you said back in the day, when a farmer knew his chickens because they were the only chickens he had, mm. to where we have now mass factory farming, where yeah. you have one farmer owning about 80,000 to 100,000 chickens. Mm-hmm. So what is one or two chickens that get? Well, and and it's, it's, yeah, yeah. It's, it's financial. It's, yeah, it's, complete, it's, it's a business. Commodities. It's day. a business yeah. model. Um, but it do, that doesn't get to the heart of what veganism is. Mm. Yes. You know, that's a different issue. Um, veganism really isn't concerned with that per se. Um, welfareism is looks at you know uh, bigger cages. Veganism is about empty cages. So veganism is grounded in the belief that animals have rights. Non-human animals have rights, mm. and they have three fundamental rights. They have the right to life, they have the right to bodily autonomy or bodily integrity, and they have the right to freedom. And how do you, how do you feel the public is receptive to that, or do you feel it's not receptive to that, or? Um, well, I know before I was vegan, when I was vegetarian, going back, I was vegetarian for twenty odd years. I'm vegan three years. Um, I would have, as even as a vegetarian, have kind of been sceptical that animals have rights. It's only when you really start to engage with it and you start to question yourself. Well, what reason would we not give them these rights? And you start to reflect on it more and more like all these things you challenge yourself and you challenge the assumptions and you know bit by bit you begin to realize that the arguments for denying animals their rights fall apart fairly quickly and then what you're left with you're left with an acceptance that yes animal animals have rights now what do i do with that because if you accept animals have rights and you continue to abuse those rights then you're 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 doing something immoral Mm. and unethical see this thing i think uh, as well it defines where you get rights from as well so I think a lot of people understand that hitting a dog is wrong because Mm. you know the dog has some kind of sentience to it and Mm. we kind of put um rights with sentience that's where the whole kind of you know Mm. but then you're you're saying that uh some animals like cows don't have sentience we know that's not true I mean these animals I, I I understand but I think that's because people find it a lot more well one that's hidden from us the the uh the the whole kind of end of life like everyone sees cows in fields and happy cows in fields yeah. but at the end of the day you don't see there's a reason there's no windows in slaughterhouses absolutely yeah because yeah, yeah. people would stop eating meat yeah uh, you know but there's enough videos out there that if you are willing to challenge yourself on this you go onto youtube mm-hmm. and you will find a countless number of videos showing you the reality of the end of these animals lives oh and i think if people were made watch that then they definitely would probably at least eat wouldn't eat meat that day maybe well, but this is the thing: know, it's, the, the, it's, these things fade. Like I, I yeah. kind of like yeah. I have seen those videos, and I will say I didn't eat meat for a couple of days. Yeah. But then it faded from my mind, and I. And my response to you would be: that's because you're not grounding your decision in the understanding of the rights of the animal. And this is where you know there's the difference yeah. between a plant-based diet. So people can adopt a plant-based diet for environmental reasons or for health reasons. That's all brilliant. Go for it. All of those things are good. But veganism is grounded in the rights of the animals. It's not about us. It's mm-hmm. not about our health. It's about the rights of the animals. So you made a very uh, interesting distinction between, uh, you called it welfareism yeah. and, and veganism because um, I'm, not, I'm not a veter- vegetarian myself, but I, I, I am, I'm, you know, like I am very open to the questions of like, how can we improve, uh, you know, we're not, we're not realistically going to, to, to abolish, uh, you know, um, agriculture and raising animals and all that. That's not going away any time. Maybe it will down the line, but it's not going away anytime soon. And I, I feel that in, in like our political landscape, you know, those are, those are things, those are discussions that can be engaged. And I, I, I would get probably a very broad uh, agreement on like, mm. well, okay, how can we, how can we improve the quality of life of animals? Um, you know, are there, like, I, I know there are horrific videos coming out of uh, mainly countries like China. China is, is oh, definitely, listen, yeah. The, watch Land of Hope and Glory that's across the water in the UK. We have plenty of footage. I, w- I was going Ireland to ask because well. I, I, well, I, I actually know people in, in, the, um, um, in, in the agriculture business in, in Ireland. And I'm told that Ireland has, you know, it's, it's, it's maybe it's not the best, but it's definitely a, a, a better country in terms of uh, the different animal protection laws that it has. No, Ireland has dreadful animal protection laws. Our welfare okay. law, Ireland is the, the major puppy, far, puppy farm capital of Europe. Okay. Um, you know, uh, Ireland ha- uh, rares for, um, for food 
hundreds of thousands of pigs every year and they're all kept indoors in factory farms they're kept in these small little crates and um, you know they're they're gassed the main the main way of, of killing pigs in ireland is is in a gas chamber and um, you know there is nothing humane about how we're treating and if we think that somehow we we're, we're not the the US so therefore our animals are doing better we're fooling ourselves you know just because our cows are more likely to to be fed out on grassland than kept in factory farms you know they're still going to end up in the same slaughterhouse it's still the same knife that's going to go across their throat they're still going to die dairy cows die aged between four and six years their natural lifespan is 25 years so we're still killing what are essentially adolescents you know, we've, we've, we've destroyed them by the time they reach six years of age. Mm. You know, we're fooling ourselves if we think that somehow we're morally superior because we treat our animals better than other countries. But there is, I mean, there is a distinction, a distinction to be made, for sure. Like, you, you've, you've, you've agreed to say, you know, China is definitely... Like, I, I, I don't know the specifics of, like, you know, uh, what is... That's kind of why I wanted to bring you on. Mm. I don't know the specifics of, like, what, what is the protection laws in America versus the UK versus France. I'm, I'm, I wouldn't be able to explain to you, but, uh, you know, there are, they are, they are a lot of rooms for improvement. Yeah. That, you know, I think you can fruits. both be right at the same time here. Yeah, I think no, you I'm can just, say um, that, you know, yeah, what, no. like one horrific act can be less horrific, you know, less horrific <laughs> than another horrific act. You but know? That's, that's basically what you're saying, that, you know, yeah. let's try and be as, the least amount of horrific as yes. we can. Y you know, that's that's... Which is not a it, it maybe not a great standing point. I will it's, I will grant you not that. A, that's the lowest possible rung that we can be starting from. And the danger is that if we get caught up in welfareism, so we're talking about bigger cages, you know, grass fed, and we try and and keep looking at it's tinkering with the problem. And um, and yes, it improves the lives of the animals there and then, but they're still going to the same. Faith. Right, and we're still absolutely trampling across any rights that they have. But it can mean the whole world for the animals that are in those situations. It, it That's kind of what I'm trying to it get can. at. It's like you know, as 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 much as like I can I can I can see what you're trying to achieve in terms of of a long term goal. I'm just trying to think in terms of. Uh, I mean, maybe that's my 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 bias. I'm I'm a very marginal thinker. I'm always trying to think of like I, what's the next little I, step we can I we can take. I think we need to be really really careful because we can head into a way of trying to justify. And if we are to accept, and we can have this discussion of whether or not we accept, I accept. By my philosophy is that animals have rights. You two might disagree with me. But if you're getting into, as a meat eater, into welfareism, then there's a danger that you're just looking for ways to justify a behaviour that somehow, in your heart, you know is not moral. So, you know, if, if you're engaging in an immoral behaviour, you know, but you know that they had a nice life before you cut their throat, somehow that soothes and makes it a little bit better and more palatable for you. My job as an animal rights activist and a vegan is to challenge you on that and say you're just letting yourself off the hook a little bit there. As in, like, you know, uh, you mean as like, um, um, what's it called again? Um, like a kind of a confirmation bias of like, oh, I eat meat, therefore I need to find... You're, you're saying, yeah. careful, that maybe yeah. you're just... You're, your starting position is, I eat meat. And you're what working is the, backwards trying to justify that What is the justification that I can take? Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. See, see, this is the thing. I, I feel... I, I actually agree with you. We've talked quite a lot about veganism mm -hmm. in the past. <clears throat> and I actually, you know, I've always... I, I accept your moral kind of arguments. They, they, There's no beating uh, the moral arguments if you come from the idea that animals feel pain, that they're obviously yeah. alive... They're sentient. They're sentient. They have communities. They have... They, so they, so morally, to cause something, the sentience to feel pain is yeah, wrong in yeah. my eyes. But then at the end, they there's this cognitive live. dissonance in my head where I'm like, I, I forget about that when, when meat comes on the table and some like reptile brain part of my <laughs> brain turns on and goes, ooh, yum, meat. You know? So, so, so did you ever feel that? Or were you just like, once you kind of like... Swallowed that. Swallowed the, the red pill. The, ve the vegan pill. The yeah. vegan pill, well, and you just like never. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, like I said, I was vegetarian for about twenty years. I still ate cheese, I drank milk, ate eggs, um, and I ate fish. Okay. Um, and one day I went to World Vegetarian Day three years ago. I went to World, and um, Laura from NARA, the National Animal Rights Association, was speaking. She didn't show any graphic images. She just stood up and spoke clearly, and and 
with evidence and spoke about the reality of those industries that I was still engaging with and I was still supporting by giving them my money. You mean consuming like a dairy consuming product? Dairy, eggs. Consuming eggs. And I went away and thought, and I, I thought, I'm going to have to think about this. I'm going to have to. And I looked and I looked at my evidence and my evidence brought me to the point where in a very short time, I realized I couldn't continue to, to spend my money and support this industry and still think of myself as an ethical person who loves animals. Mm. That it just, it just the, the two couldn't. They, there was no way that they could, they could exist together. So for you, the cognitive dissonance didn't happen in your it head. It didn't really happen. No, no. no. And my transition, because everyone was telling me what a challenge it would be to transition into veganism, and you know, it probably took me about six months. And um, the food thing was very quick, but I had like uh, clothes, I had wool, and had leather, and um, bits and pieces, uh, cosmetics, that kind of thing, which I just couldn't afford to. Out and sure, at that stage, the damage was done. Yeah. Once yes. those things were used up, I've replaced them with, with eth more ethical vegan products. So, yeah, you know, I, and I'm like renowned for my laziness. And yeah. if I can do it, then really, <laughs> I, you know, I have to commend, yes, <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> you, yeah, know, you know me, I'm both renowned for my laziness. <laughs> I, I, yes, it, it takes it takes quite a bit of, of effort for sure. We feel really bad it's, for this guy who whoever is like listening to our podcast right now and gets like you know completely changed by you and has that. Mercedes sitting out there with the, <laughs> with with the, the leather, leather seat, seat and I, now has to get rid of it. I, uh, I, I was unfortunate <laughs> enough to be involved in a car accident a couple of years back and I, I had hadn't wanted to, hadn't planned to change my car but was forced to because some Egypt wrote it off for me um, but <laughs> so I went into the showroom you know, well I went into the showroom and I said uh, um, they were showing me the various car I said okay the one that has no leather this <laughs> is, is, is the one we're going with and he's like we don't normally get that request <laughs> you get the they get the yeah. opposite request everything uh, they all want the yeah, nice okay. uh, yeah, yeah mm. the leather but no the, the one that has the least amount of mm. but you know and it's and again it's an interesting thing because I'm aware that every time, time I drive my car I damage the environment and I kill certain things that hit the bonnet and so it's not about seeking some form of perfection you okay. know, we, we all know that when we exist in the world, we leave an impression. On yes. It. We leave our imprint. Veganism is about leaving the least amount of an imprint that you can as you make your way along. All right. The um, least amount of imprint. So yeah. do you feel that there is any kind of ethical consumption of animal products out there? Look, I'm really, really lucky. I live in a society where I have choice mm -hmm. and I have money to be able to exercise those, that choice. Mm -hmm. I, was, um, I wasn't doing outreach. I just happened as a vegan table as we, um, on uh, College Green there. Mm -hmm. um, and I was walking past and I was talking to the people who were running the table and I got talking to someone who walked up to the table and unintentionally ended up doing some vegan outreach uh, by accident. <laughs> as, as, it just, as, it just came do. out. But it the just, two guys I was talking to, they were brothers and one of them had watched, they have a, a 3D virtual reality headset thing. Guys, um, and yeah. One of the guys had just watched that and I had tried to watch it and I thought, no, I really, I know this, I really can't, uh, you know. But um, we got talking and they were talking about meat and their consumption of meat and very similar conversation to having now and after about 10-15 minutes of chatting to them one of them said to me well you know we're both homeless we're we're you know and and I was like this is I've just you know I went away and I thought this is ridiculous me trying to in my very comfortable position that I'm in <laughs> trying to tell two homeless guys what they should and shouldn't be eating yeah. you know so I'm perfectly aware that I'll never be in the situation where I'm forced to make a choice that goes against my ethics because I'm in a comfortable position. Yeah. So I can never hold it against someone who has no other options open to them, mm. you know. But saying that, though, like you said, there is kind of... I, I, I know in Dublin there's a lot more choice now you, with being vegan. There's a lot more... Yeah. Like, you can go to most restaurants and... Even if there isn't a vegan option on the menu, they will try they to try. make something yeah. vegan. In the three years um, I've been vegan, there's two times I've walked out of a restaurant because they couldn't. They said they couldn't serve me anything. Mm. And both times I followed up with an email and I was like, you know what, put, put one of your vegetarian dishes that you can take the cheese out of. Mm. Job done. And I got positive responses both times from yeah. them. Okay. I will say, though, it is definitely more... It seems like a quite expensive diet. I, I've switched, for example, my milk um, to... 
uh, almond or soy. Yeah. And I've just noticed for some... I, it, I have no idea why, because it should be cheaper, you would think, to produce almond or it's, meat. It's, stuff, the, but it's, it's the, but it's the nearly, level of the production. It's nearly twice right. the price for some reason, yeah. But, but, but you can save that money because if you look at the price of fish or meat and compare it to the price of carrots or broccoli, yeah. you've got a saving straight away. See, that's why I'm a terrible person because I still do <laughs> <laughs> fish and meat. So I've just managed to <laughs> manage to go vegan, yeah. a, a vegan milk and managed to increase my, uh, <laughs> increase my grocery uh, price. And, well, this is actually uh, an interesting interesting segue because so if you're talking about um um you know if, if you're talking about almond milk or soy milk you definitely would have kind of a premium uh, uh price to it just because they're um uh you know they are seen in in terms of products i'm i'm trying not to use too much of the the irish uh, uh neve colloquialism but you know it's it's the kind of like hippie uh, we can veggie. blame hipsters yeah yeah the kind of hipstery product and yeah. it's like oh those hipsters they're gonna buy everything we can charge so uh, yeah but again supply and demand as demand yes. for product goes up the price will come down yeah you know um th- there's very few coffee shops that you go into now wouldn't have a non-dairy alternative oh yeah yeah you mm. know and uh, yeah, it generally doesn't put a uh, an extra charge onto your takeout coffee. Yeah, no, they stopped doing that. I know yeah. Starbucks used to do it, but they don't uh, do it anymore. O'Brien's used to do it. I think they used to charge thirty cent. I they think were they making they have stopped. I think they're making yeah. a cheeky little profit um, on that. I think yeah, definitely. definitely. Thirty, yeah. 30 <laughs> cent for a, a dribble I think of milk. A case yeah. of discrimination there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but there's an interesting question that I was um, asking myself because. So this is this is um, on on the question of like um, um, food and diet and alternatives. Mm. One of the issue with the vegan diet is you, you kind of have to monitor um, um, on on such and macros what you are getting because you may not necessarily get all like you you can get definitely if you pay attention if you get some supplements it's it's achievable no question there but if if you follow instinctively uh, a lot of people would have just the reflex to go with like a ver- almost all carbs and and could have some some um, you know there could be you could lack certain nutrients. And I see the, the one obvious answer for me would be, well, we have all those new technologies in terms of agriculture, genetic editing, um, you know, selection, etc. that could provide, I believe, great alternatives. You could have genetically enhanced lentils for your protein intakes or whatever. But uh, I, there is a, a certain overlap between being a vegan and at the same time being the sort of uh, hippie environmentalist who wants everything to be natural. And, and you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, the organic crowd, right, 100% right. organic crowd, and I yeah. feel like there's kind of a missed opportunity. Uh, I, I don't know if you're getting that feeling, okay. but so the, the, you've just said a whole mouthful there. There's a lot oh, there sorry. to unpack. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> okay. Sorry. So let me just break this down. Okay, the first thing is veganism isn't a diet. <laughs> there is a there is a, right. a philosophical conviction. Oh, absolutely. Restrictions, yeah. But just when you say the vegan diet, just again to bring it back that yeah. veganism isn't a diet. It's an animal rights. Yes. Philosophy. Okay. Um, there's the misunderstanding that vegans can't live healthy, can't get enough protein. Absolutely, you can. Um, you need to make sure that you're taking in your, your, bean, your beans and your lentils and your... You know, yeah, you, I've granted that point. Absolutely. You, you can be a healthy vegan yes. and you can be an unhealthy vegan. Yeah. Um, but I don't think you can be a healthy meat eater. We can come back to that point. Personally, I don't think you can be a healthy meat eater. Um, the evidence, the scientific evidence, the medical evidence. I mean, only the other day there was a, a study. They're saying processed meats are as, as high a carcinogenic as 20 cigarettes a day. I don't think you can be a healthy meat eater. I think the healthy option is a plant-based diet. Um, with regards to the whole hippie organic kind of thing, um, you know what? It takes all types. Yes. Th- there are plenty of vegans out there who will eat processed food. You know, high salt, high sugar, lots of e numbers and and stuff. We're not sure what the chemical word really is. Um, there are vegans out there who will only eat organic or wherever possible will eat organic. But you know, I've seen <laughs> I've seen vegans. There are vegans who support the use of GMOs. There are vegans who don't. Mm. So it's a it's a broad church. Right. I've seen <laughs> quite recently um, a vegan post on a Facebook page. Um, where the woman was had bought some organic broccoli and she was complaining because she found bugs in her broccoli and someone pointed <laughs> out, well, this is the p- price you pay because they don't use pesticides. And she was like, yuck, I'm throwing this straight in the bin. Mm. So, you know, I think there has to be an awareness of, yeah. of what organic really is and, yeah. and, and the ick factor because I've got 
bugs in my broccoli right. and I might have eaten them, <laughs> you know? I mean, this is this is the, the, the engineer bug that's itching my head in the sense of like, oh, like problem to be solved. Like how can we get like a lot more, you know, how can we use leverage plants and, and, and genes and crossbreeding, et cetera, to provide better alternatives? Yeah. That's one of the, I mean, I, I, at a personal level, one of the reasons why I'm not cautioning on my meat consumption is I, I know it'll be it'll be actually difficult for a whole sorts of reasons, but it'll be difficult to to get a, a balanced diet out of it into like to to check to check the my I macro. Disagree. I have uh, I don't want to get into it. The it's, only, there's a lot there's of detail, a, a but I have a couple of dietary restrictions, so it makes things a bit other, complex. Like vegans who are also celiac, um, yeah. you know, um, and. You know, all I'd say is don't make assumptions. Go and look at the research. Oh, but I want to be crystal you know, clear. Uh, to, to me, it's absolutely achievable. It's it yeah, definitely I, is achievable. I think a balanced I, diet yeah, is I want to be crystal clear yeah. on this. My my the only caveat I was making is is you know uh, your intuition may lead you to to cut on certain foods and go for certain foods that are not necessarily very balanced. So you have to pay attention. That's all but, but I that's said. That's with, what I but said. But that's yeah. the same with, any, with everything. With absolutely. Any oh, diet absolutely. That you're, that you're, but the difference is that when you're an, eating a plant based diet you're less likely to be putting harmful substances into your body because the harmful substances are coming from the meat and the dairy. You know, the things like the saturated fat, the cholesterol, you know, these things are coming from your meat and your dairy. Well, They're uh, not coming from your broccoli. It's it's a bit more complicated because uh, it's... The, the issue, and, and there's there's a lot of research in, in diet, and the problem is there's a little bit of like a, a micro versus macro difficulty. That is, we understand a lot of the micro, we understand mm. all of what's happening at like a biological level, at a chemical level. But to do long-term studies and, and, you know, control for all parameters to know what gets you cancer 20 years down the line, you could yeah. probably stand for 30 minutes and quote me studies that show that vegan diets are superior to uh, meat-based diets, and I could probably do the reverse. It's really complicated to read through there's, there's the scientific a, literature yeah. and, and uh, come up with a straight answer. And there's answer. a couple of reasons that. There's a website I direct you to, um, uh, nutritionfacts.org. It's Dr. Michael Grieger. Just have a look, watch his videos. Um, he's covered a huge range of topics. Mm. The thing is, he is very much interested in evidence based and yes. he has spent his life going through the the medical journals what you've got to remember is and this isn't i don't want to strange kind of conspiracy theory kind <laughs> of um but it, a lot of the research that's done is sponsored research so you've got to look at who's sponsoring the research mm. and a study that says you know an egg a day is a-okay sponsored by the egg industry you've <laughs> got to you've got to put your skeptics hat on there right mm. there is no one making huge money out of broccoli or turmeric or leeks you know they're making big money out of a pill that will control your high cholesterol or not make you prevent well, your your chances of having a heart attack the I'm, money I'm gonna... is not being invested into the studies on the joys of broccoli because there's no money to be to be made and the amount of money that's put into research on medication you know sometimes the amount of money spent promoting that research is double what they've actually spent doing the research. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm going to put my pharma shrill hat put on. Put your pharma <laughs> shrill hat on. And again, I don't want to strain to, you know, yeah, I, yeah. I, this, I know there's a lot of conspiracy theories around how they're trying to control us all, big pharma and all that. Mm. But I think we have to look very carefully at what the literature is telling us. And to do that, sometimes you've got to go digging because they're n the, the small studies, they're there and there is, there is an accumulative effect, but we're just not getting the information. Mm -hmm. I'm going to put my farmer's real hat on now and I was just going to say like um, I'm assuming the food industry works in the same way they're going to do studies they're going to do things and yes they're going to publish what look, makes them look good uh, but like that that every every even the like organic 100% uh, non-GMO people will will do that yeah. every industry does that yeah. not just yeah. not the, just the, big the, meat no, and not just not eggs just big, no. and Big meat, no, big eggs. Big eggs. <laughs> it just means that in order uh, but, to... But every, everyone will do it. Even the broccoli people. I know this, you say there's not that much money in broccoli, but individuals will respond to incentives. And the, if that incentive says, we're going to sell more broccoli, they'll they'll do it. It's You've sometimes, to find the evidence, you've got to dig a little bit yes. more than the headlines. Yeah. Oh, and right. yeah. But uh, we, we've... Um, I think that there was, uh, there was uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of things that's changed in the field of dietary, um, um, you know, in, in, in the science of diets over the last few years, for instance. We've, we've discovered there were, like, legitimate conspiracies around a lot of studies on the impact of sugar, 
yes. that were just plain wrong yeah. and were just plain fabricated because yeah. some some researcher had an axe to grind under and you know so it, it it doesn't it doesn't mean being a conspiracy theorist it just means being as you said being skeptical and yeah. I like I don't want to I don't want to make a definitive statement because as I said you, either camp could s cite a litany of research it is yeah. very difficult you you, you Practically, you cannot create a study where you're going to say, we're going to control your food intake for 20 years and see what it's, it's no, very difficult it? to get those like lifelong macro, but you know, approaches. There. there are studies out there yes. and it is worth, again, that, that website, you know, anything you want to, to any ailment that you want to look up and see, he will show you what the research is saying from a plant based perspective. Mm. And I think it's definitely worth checking out. I want to switch the uh, conversation a little bit to um, vegans and how they try and obviously you guys have a goal. You you would it would be delightful if as many people who could be vegan as possible turn vegan. I, am I am I wrong in saying that? <laughs> Is that well, what you'd like? Uh, not not delightful for me, but very delightful for the animals. Delightful for the animals, but but that that would be the goal. But um, so what I see though is um is you guys focus very much on a cultural kind of aspect and creating a, a more a culture which promotes veganism rather than going for, let's say, very straightforward political goals. Like, for example, I've never seen a heard of vegans tackling subsidies for the dairy industry in Ireland, um, which could be something that you guys could do, mm. uh, which probably would make dairy products more expensive and thus maybe less people would buy them. Do you think uh. that? Do you think that's because? You think going towards more or more of a you do need more of a cultural change rather than a policy change, and and that's the only way it's going to win this is to make um, eating animals seen as not acceptable societally rather than. I I think we if we look at something like uh, cigarette smoking, yeah, there's a really good comparison to comparison be made to that, there, yeah. and part not it wasn't that long ago that smoking was cool and sexy. A and generation ago, the, yeah, 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 literally a generation like, ago. Yeah. It got to the girl, you know, real men smoked and sexy women smoked. You had the adverts, sm the guy and, on the motorcycle, and smoke yeah. menthol cigarettes were considered health promoting they were good for you you know the ads were and and there was a, such a shift you know in, mm. in the space of generations i mean now it's taboo it's yeah taboo. Do, you, do you know anyone in your circle of friends who smokes i know one person in my circle of friends who I, smokes. I, know, I know quite a number of people who've quit mm. i i know colleagues who smokes but i can't claim that i have a single friend who actually smokes no so i think if you're looking at changing culture Mm. You know, there's that piece of work that has to be done where you've got to engage with people. You've got to give them the evidence. Mm -hmm. The evidence was hidden with regard to smoking. It was hidden for a long time. Yeah. You've got to give them the evidence. And then you've got to create an atmosphere where this behavior that you need to change because it's a harmful behavior mm -hmm. becomes a taboo behavior, you know. Um, so I think if we do a comparison then to meat eating, um, I think we're, we're reaching the point now where we're starting to be able to present the evidence. I think that's the point we're reaching. Um, I know that, you know, there has been animal rights activism around for a, a number of years now. Yeah. Um, uh, sorry to interrupt. And when you say present the evidence, do you mean at a moral level? Or I think at engaging like, uh, at a moral level and really getting people to, to think about the harm. Okay. And, and to think about, again, from an animal, animal rights perspective, these most people would describe themselves as animal lovers. Most people consider themselves to be kind and compassionate and mm -hmm. caring and empathetic. And what we're saying is you're, just, you're extending your circle of compassion to include non-human animals and you're acknowledging the, their rights. Mm -hmm. that's, that's all it is. And I think that message is starting to get, come through. And I think the reason that message is coming through is because we're able to show very, very clearly the harm that it's doing to the animal, to the person, to society, to the individual, to the to the environment, you know th th this message is starting to resonate. Mm. So there's a number of different ways you can you can come at this. On the other hand, then there are groups out there. There's animal rights groups who are um, doing um, um, protests outside slaughterhouses, and they do what's called witnessing. So they'll they'll stand and pay respect to the animals as they go into the slaughterhouse, oh. um, and they lay flowers. Um, and they'll just they'll just bear witness. Um, there's the the cube of truth that you might have seen. There's uh, voiceless for the uh, anonymous for the voiceless. So they wear the anonymous 
masks. Oh, yeah, the and Guy Fawkes hold, masks. Yeah, the Guy Fawkes, and they'll hold a laptop and people can watch some of the footage from something like Earthlings, the documentary Earthlings. And then there'll be other people who walk around and will engage with people mm-hmm. and will just have a discussion about what it is they're seeing. And, and you know, and again, it's it's just a conscious raising. Then there's, uh, we have very few politicians, unfortunately, in Ireland. We have a couple, Maureen, um, Maureen O'Sullivan is one. Um, Ireland's a very big, meaty country, see, though. You see, such a, and it, the, the agricultural lobby is, is a, it's a strong vote. Um, but looking at things like, um, I mean, do you know we have three fur farms still operating in Ireland? They're, they're, there's, they're farming mink. As I said earlier, Ireland is the capital in Europe for puppy farms. There's about 50 odd puppy farms still operating mm. in Ireland with very little legislation. Um, very, very, if you want to talk about welfare, I mean, this dreadful welfare conditions. Um, and, the, you know, greyhound racing in Ireland is a huge sport. Um, there's, there's still hunts going on. You know, we're so far behind when it comes to where the legislation. So there are groups who are lobbying and trying to get change through from a legislative point of view so there's many different ways of looking at this and mm-hmm. approaching this yeah do you think then one day it will be like cigarettes and it will just one like decade and it'll just snowball maybe i'd love to think it would happen that quick i like, think we're, we're, like we're, 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 as quick as maybe let's say me and manny's kids would be i think we're reaching that point you know and mm. you see this isn't something that we, people tend to think of veganism as something that's just happened over the last few years you know like i said in the uk back in the 70s they were breaking into laboratories and, and freeing animals you know the, the, this has been going on for quite a while now the the, the approach may be changing slightly i think again with uh, with social media mm-hmm. you can't hide from the information well, if we take example from different other uh, type of uh, social movements, we know a lot of these are uh, uh, where, you know, you can plot them on a hockey stick graph. Uh, I think that gay marriage is probably the best uh, example if you, want to, if you want to draw a comparison in the sense that, you know, what's the support for gay marriage over the last 30 years? It is quite, quite literally a hockey stick if you put it on a chart. So, it, and but not, not all social changes is like that. So we'll see, you know, it's obviously it's those kind of, things where you have to kind of like we'll, we'll see in 30 years if we'll we're right or wrong but if if it does take off it, it would take i would presume it would take off quite rapidly i think it will i think it will i think we've passed the stage where um animal rights activism and animal I'm advocating for animal rights has has passed that oh that's a very radical proposal <laughs> stage because there was a stage in, in every social movement, there's that stage, votes for women, that's radical. You know, not owning a slave, that's radical. You know, we, um, uh, gays getting married, how, how very radical. And we reach this stage where everyone realises, well, actually, that's not radical at all. That's just, you know, rights. And So I think we've reached that stage, or very close to that stage, where most people aren't shocked and don't think it's radical that we think that animals should have rights. Mm. You mentioned there, um, this is something where we might actually disagree, because I agree with you morally, causing pain to something that's alive is probably bad, but this is somewhere where I think we disagree. You s- seem to justify people breaking into laboratories and stealing animals. Um, as someone who, again, works for mm. Big Pharma Shrill, I, I know that there's like protests outside of my headquarters every day, or every other day, basically by... Um, animal rights activists who say you shouldn't do experimentations on animals but do you think there is a justified trade-off if let's say you create a drug which will over the lifetime of its use save maybe a million human lives to justify that maybe doing experiments on a couple hundred chimps is bad and a couple thousand rats okay so again let's bring it back animals have three rights Mm -hmm. the right to freedom the right to bodily autonomy okay and the right to their life. So once you begin to infringe on those rights, you're morally heading into... Oh, I, I agree. Okay. I didn't say it was completely so, moral. So I then, didn't say it was completely so moral. So then you, you're going to try and justify your actions by saying, well, you know, big picture will save human lives along the way. Mm. There's um, a group up there. Let me just uh, find the name of them. And um, animal on animal research so animal right animal free research uk okay worth having a look at and they deal with this 
So I assume issue. they promote the use of uh, artificial systems and... Uh, Have, oh, it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. I hear the guy, um, Patel, his name is... Bioinformatics, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can't remember this guy's first name. Patel was his surname and he spoke at uh, VegFest last year. Yeah. And it was one that I was still kind of, we're saving lives. And, you know, and we've, we were all taking medicine and, you know, we all want to not die from cancer. So isn't mm-hmm. this research going to save all our lives? And what he presented was just, it really changed my perspective. He showed that when we stop using animals for research, we become so innovative because we are thinking outside the box and we are coming up with these amazing new technologies and ways of carrying out this research. And the whole thing about doing research on animals is, you know, it's not scientific. These are not biologically similar to us. We can only learn so much by 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 carrying out this research, you know. But the, the, no one ever claimed that animals no. were genetically similar. No, they're, no, no, but, they're, but, no, they're but, close enough but, that they they could carry the same diseases that we we, we yeah, can. But have. they could react. To, they're biologically dissimilar. Enough, yes. they can react to drugs. But that, in that happens all the time. Ways. That happens so all the time. So why carry yes. out scientific research? I'm asking you, as a scientist, why carry out scientific research that is not scientifically sound? I'm not. Well, no. This is the thing. It, it's we use them as a proxy, okay? And I didn't say a prox. I didn't say they were like exactly similar to us, but as a proxy, they work quite well. Especially now with the new humanized, uh, humanized uh, rats, and which we can but, use but, to, to but which, which are very out- similar to, 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 to the use of to the use of humanized but cells if you, and how they are going to interact with drugs and how drugs will interact with other drugs. So if there was the, a ban pl- placed tomorrow on the use of animals in research, blanket ban. Blanket ban, okay. okay just accept it, it's happened. Okay, yep. And you're all there in your little lab with your white coat scratching your head. Immediately you start thinking, okay. We're going to move to more bioinform. We're going to have to move to more to. bioinformatics. So, we're going to have to move to so cell-based uh, Petri so dish it. mode. And, but, and, and, but, and but this is the thing. But I would have, develop new that, technologies. That, that, ignore, that ignores, though, the systematic effects of, the, of drugs on, on the, the, the body system. Which, which is also but, important. But, because but the if, body if system I'm, if I'm of a saying, chimp is different. So how, no, how but, much can we extrapolate? I, it, is complete, it is different, it, but it's not completely different. And it's useful as a proxy to what will happen. Remember, we are 98%, basically, or 99% similar to chimps. So, so it's, it's, I'm not saying it's perfect. No, but it's far it's, from perfect. And, and, and I would prefer, I would be much happier, okay, to be working on something and test it on a chimp first, Rather than testing it into human to see what the but system no effects are going to be. Tested on a human first. There's so many new there technologies is. out there that I, we can run all these scientifically sound tests. You know, you can grow. You know, you know. Yes, you, you can, can. You can grow these cells, these cells and, and find out what. Yes, but it's, it's, it's. You're not going to have a systematic. It's not going to have a sy- but similar system. What, what, what happens on when humans anyway? What happens when this when this dr- this drug goes into the liver and it changes? And then what's going to do to but the system do, then? And then do, all this kind of. So you do your tests on your on your grown liver cells. But you, 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 you're going to test drugs on humans anyway. You don't just introduce so, them. All, all drugs are tested. But let me on okay. So let me let me put it this way: if we don't use if we don't use animal for testing, you have two things that will happen. First, those alternatives are more expensive, and we already know that research is is the is the main the, the main driver for you know healthcare costs, especially drug costs. Especially uh, drug costs are already through the roof. We're already trying to find way to cut costs on on, on drug research. You know, the, why, are your, drug your, costs, why are drug cro- costs through the roof? Uh, because of research, research. primarily. No. Yes. Yeah. Well, you have, okay. Uh, no, because it's a profit-making business. And, and and the profit rates are, once profit you take rates. research costs well, out at, of the equation, at, not that much. Yeah, look, and you have a lot of risk associated like, to it. The economics my of... My company spends, I think, about five and a half billion this year on, on our R&D. That's, if, if you're treating, you know... Like, like patients, that's that has to be paid for. It has to Absolutely, be. It's, it's, but it, they'll make the money back on. The, uh, look, you'll make your money back when you sell the drug. So it might take a little bit longer to develop the drug, but ethically, are, we're weighing up two things here. We're weighing yeah. up the, the morality of testing on animals mm. yeah. and the ethics of holding back a drug a but, little bit longer until we're certain. Well, that that no, 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 that's not. That's actually not not the thing. The two things that are going to happen. Uh, I'm sorry, because I just wanted to finish that point. So first, you'll have a. Uh, healthcare costs that are going to rise and second you're going to have tests that are not going to be as reliable so you may end up you know you may end up in the second test phase when you're testing on humans with 
um, you know, effect, secondary effects you had not anti anticipated on your petri dish. So you know, it's 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 art. You could make that case, uh, but I, then I'm I'm just I'm just pointing out, you know, though there, you know, with every uh, policy, you're gonna have costs and benefits. The cost of of switching and reducing the the harm done to animal means drugs are gonna be less affordable, and those test phases are gonna potentially would have higher risk for human test subjects. That's is where it, I think would be the main issue. Pharma has lots of money. What, what is, I think is the main issue, and, and they will make their money back even if the R and D is more expensive. Yes. But what I think the main issue would be would be the safety uh, uh, issues. Before so you're gonna have a lot of you're gonna have a lot, of, gonna have a lot so more difficulty. A question. You're gonna have a lot more difficulty saying uh, to a regulator. We want to put this in humans without having first put it in another system that's similar to humans. So like if, politically, would be difficult. If they're yeah. if they're testing a drug and they're testing it on, say, rats, yeah. for example, and they're giving this drug to the rats and the rats are reacting quite badly to this drug. Well, you're not going to put it in humans. Well, are they going to stop testing the drug at that stage? No, and not say necessarily. this drug is isn't isn't forget it. Let's throw a hat at it. This is not going to work. No, not necessarily because um, we have to find out what is causing the negative effects. So, for example, if we have a positive therapeutic. Um, let's say we are testing for HIV, and we say, oh well, there's this protein, and it can let's say uh, ligand cut HIV out of a cell. Fantastic. We need to look into this because mm -hmm. it possibly is a cure for HIV. Now we put it in rats, and we find that it's killing the rats. I am personally, I don't place rat life and human life at the same level. So I am very happy to make modifications to our, our drug mm -hmm. and test it in a new set of rats and see if that works. And then another set? And another set? Yes. Yeah. And another yeah. set? Yeah. How yeah. many people, how for, many, for, for, how, many, until what how many people have HIV? If, 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 no, how, how many people have HIV? 40 million. Well, no, okay, I could kill uh, 80 million rats without and, blinking okay, an eye so if it meant Okay, so you'll just keep testing and testing and testing and testing. So then you get a result, the rats don't die. Yeah. Yeah. What's the next step then? Well, well, then we do we move to human trials, safety trials, obviously phase one. Okay. So, if if you're talking about so uh, first of all, I'm not saying that a rat life and a human life are equal. Mm. Okay. Okay. I, I don't I don't believe that. Yeah. But I do think that if there was wasn't those rats there, mm -hmm. I do think that we will have to we will. By necessity, we will have to develop new technologies for testing these drugs. Yes. Oh, we could. So oh, I no. do this think, could. in a way, that using these animals as, as for tests is actually holding us back scientifically. Because it's, we're not developing the new technologies. There's no, need to, there's no need to reinvent the wheel, though, if the wheel works. But the wheel doesn't work, not if you're a rat. <laughs> the wheel doesn't work if you're a rat, fair the enough. Wheel, the wheel doesn't. But if you, if you can take the rats out of the equation and... and subsequently develop fantastic new technologies surely that's only but actually, going to benefit no actually as, as i pointed out like uh, you know the, i i wasn't maybe i didn't communicate well i wasn't i wasn't offering a refutation as much as i, I was just pointing out you know that the outcome of of taking animals out of testing would be things that are politically highly incorrect and high, like you cannot sell the idea that our test phases are going to be uh, even 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 if it's 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 purely marginal that our test phases are not going to be as safe and then drugs are going to be more expensive. It's it, that's that's just what I wanted to to point out that those are politically you you cannot sell that politically. There, there might be politically politically you might correct. That's, but that's you might not all be I wanted to point out. Correct because there could be other technologies the, out there that we can use absolutely. In place. But then you have to. That's that's all I wanted to point out. That yeah. then you have problems that are more in the political sphere. And to I'll be point out with. that I think. That rats are an ex and especially uh, humanized rats are an excellent proxy for uh, <laughs> for for finding out what will happen to a drug in a system. So you, you also better hope that karma isn't a thing. <laughs> <laughs> I, I want to um, ask you very quickly. Actually, you said there are three fundamental rights that um, you you think all animals should have, mm. which is freedom, bodily autonomy, and life. Mm. Now, as an individual myself who has two dogs who I love very much. Mm. Uh, I am uh, definitely two of those uh, two of those uh, freedoms I am infringing upon. Freedom, I, they do not have freedom. Uh, yeah. I keep them as my pets. They are under the uh, incredible uh, dictatorship of Aaron and endure <laughs> the, the, benevolent uh, the, the benevolent dictatorship of Aaron and enjoy you, mandatory pampering 24 hours a day. You can tell they're dogs and not cats. <laughs> 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 because, because no one owns a cat. <laughs> like, 
uh, so so is is the dictatorship of mandatory pampering <laughs> an infringement on the bodily autonomy and freedom of pets so pets are really interesting pets fall mm-hmm. into a slightly different category because like you said we have domesticated these animals for a different purpose we've domesticated them for companionship mm-hmm. we're, we're not we don't need them for food we don't need not them for anymore. clothing thankfully <laughs> unless we but get we into have, some apocalyptic scenarios and then and then fido starts to look really tasty after day three without food <laughs> exactly, exactly. So, we've got, we've got a, so we've got this relationship with these animals we have a very different relationship with these animals i would suggest it's a hypocritical relationship but that's a, another argument that's interesting we, as someone who owns a cat though isn't it i don't own a cat oh i'm sorry <laughs> oh i'm so, so sorry the so cat has a servant <laughs> named <laughs> ashley I, in, okay in so, fairness, so we, this relationship yeah. exists with these animals um what i would like and um, i think the, the vegan i again i'm not speaking for all vegans my own approach is i'd like to see the breeding of these animals e- either become highly regulated or cease because we have so many of these cats and dogs, to take cats and dogs as an example, in shelters who are on death row because they have no homes. I would love to see those animals mm. taken care of first. Um, I think that what we need to start doing is we need to start looking very closely at the relationship with these animals and again start respecting their rights but accepting that this is a very different relationship that we have because we have made these animals dependent on us so when you open your home and take in a cat or a dog what you're taking in is you're taking in a companion Mm -hmm. and you're taking in a responsibility Mm -hmm. i would really really ask people not anyone listening to us never buy an animal Animals are not commodities. They're not products. They're not ours to buy and sell. Please don't buy cats and dogs because you're perpetuating the most horrific puppy farms um, and, and breeding practices. Go to your shelter and adopt. Bring that companion into your home. Know that you have full responsibility for that companion and just give it all the pampering and hugs and cuddles on its terms. <laughs> <laughs> I cannot stress enough <laughs> I maybe terms. overdo it a little but bit. <laughs> I, have, I have two companion cats, both rescues. And Is that both what you call them, it, companion they're my, cats? They're my companions. You don't say they're your I, cats? They're not, no, I don't own them. I don't know. I don't have... And the you say your kids? Well, in, in, in I don't have any of those. <laughs> <laughs> Parents don't own their kids. No, but you say, no, but they say, they say kids. your kids. Yeah, but no, they're my companions. They yeah. share my, my home with me and I have a responsibility for them. Both of the cats are spayed. Mm. Yes. So I yeah. have infringed on their right to bodily integrity. Same, I've done the same with my dogs. But I've done that because we have, we're in this situation where we have domesticated these animals, we have made them reliant upon us and I don't want them reproducing 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 and thus furthering the problem we have of more and more and more of these animals who are dependent on us but i mean at this stage it's almost a medical procedure because you're not like you know it's kind of like saying oh i'm 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 infringing on my cat's bodily autonomy by bringing him to the vet when he broke his his, his leg you no, know that, because I, I would, again we've got the responsibility yeah yeah but that's what i mean i would put but i would put nutrying on the same level on to the, me under it's, the it's a medical yeah I would. Um, and I've volunteered in the past for a cat rescue that does uh, trap neuter release yes. um, with the homeless cats, the feral cats. Mm-hmm. Um, and I agree with trap neuter release yes, because absolutely. the other option is you have pest control companies coming in and putting down poison well, and, even, and wiping so, out colonies that way. So if we can, you yes. know, it's a necessary evil because we have this relationship that we have created. And, and I would well, go a step further. Cats, if, you, if, you, if you put... If you put, you know, aside the the uh, horrific conditions of, uh, like, you know, as you said, the, the way that, that, that feral c- cats are treated, even if you put that aside, the life of a feral cat is a life of misery. It's misery. Cats have evolved. The, 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 so there's a, a, just a little bit of a, um, evolutionary biology in, in, um, insight in there. Cats have evolved to to become the companions of, of humans. Yes. They're, they've yeah. lost part of their, you know, hunting capacity. They've become cuter. They've become, mm-hmm. and as well in terms of, uh, you know, uh, uh, temperament they are easy to live with mm. because we discarded the ones that, that were, were more they, rebellious yes. yeah. so you know it's it's i i i, I personally I, I don't you know i i would say having a cat even at a moral level 
you know, I have two cats. They have a tremendously good life. They're mm-hmm. indoor cats, but they're playing. They're getting a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of They pampering. receive better medical attention than post third world kids. <laughs> <laughs> they're getting, yes, they, they have top notch <laughs> medical attention. Um, and, you know, they will one day die of natural cause. Uh, there is just, you know, if, if you think in, in utilitarian terms, the, um, the amount of cat happiness that I brought to the world is definitely uh, outweighs the cost. I, I and I adapted them. I hope, exactly. I hope that my home will always, I'll always be in a position to open my home to an adopted animal. Yes. You know, a rescued animal. That, that, that's my hope because yeah. I feel we have a responsibility because we have created this situation with these animals um, and by abandoning them. Oh, that's abandoning a, ca- a cat, uh, an animal, it, that, is, that is, is a, yeah, uh, which yeah. I think that you know it, it can be extend to farm animals as well. You, you cannot release a farm animal in the nature no. you, because no. that's it's 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 a hard one to to deal with. No, but you know, yeah, you can't. they haven't got the the capacity they've, to survive they've, they've, because we've created them yes, not to have to the an capacity extent. to survive. We've yeah. bred them that way. Yes, yeah. so it's a, you know it's it it may be true for for wild animals that we capture and put in zoos. Okay, fine, and even then, if they've been uh, bred captive it's, it's a little bit more complicated but uh, I would not extend that courtesy to to um, you know pets for sure releasing pets is, is a horrific oh, no. thing you can do no no um, but Sue's is a whole other discussion <laughs> <laughs> yes <laughs> that's a whole other podcast for yeah. sure I, I, I think this was a fantastic talk by the way <laughs> I really enjoyed myself uh, Ashling thank you so much for coming along You're and welcome. lending your voice to us um, would you like to plug yourself online or oh, where people can find you? No, I'm not doing anything. No, uh, in that case, would you like to <laughs> recommend sharing, any books or sharing any pictures yes. of cats? Um, okay, that one that I read from earlier. Yes. Um, Tom Regan, Empty Cages, Facing the Challenge of Animal Rights. Um, yeah, if, you know, if you're in any way interested in, and, and I know both you guys, and I know you're not afraid of challenging the positions that you have in it, it with regards to anything um just challenging and i draw a lot of parallels with you know as 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 an atheist i draw a lot of parallels with leaving religion and and realizing the indoctrination process that you've gone through mm. when you become when you're raised in a religion and how it become all normalized and it's all culturally acceptable and then when you start to look at it critically and and you start to see a few things um for me there's a lot of parallels between our meat eating culture and the way we treat animals and the way we're indoctrinated into that culture um and once you start to question it and step back from it and look at it critically and how quickly it falls apart when you really are honest and critical and evidence-based so you know that's that's my final word is you know don't be a hypocrite (laughs) don't be if you love your cats and your dogs I will not eat my how, cats and dogs. How is it okay to wear cows and eat pigs when you love cats and dogs? Mm-hmm. And I challenge you that to do continue to do so makes you a hypocrite. All right, thanks very much. You're welcome. I'm, <laughs> is it the last the first time you've had your guest good ch- finished on the by your way, you're both hypocrites. Yes. <laughs> <laughs>